Not a good morning, is it? Between the virus, the ice and the distinct cold, it's not good, but there we are. Having said that, in a sense, it's been a wonderful week. I don't generally expect God to intervene in my life every two seconds in a way that I would notice, but he's done two wonderful things for us this week. Um, was it this week or last week? The header tank overflowed. It was the Feast of the Epiphany, the 6th of January, and water was dripping out of the organ. Now, you all know the organ is a very special one. It's going to be very easily damaged, dating as it does from, I think, 1926. Is that right, Colin, 1926? Yeah, I've got, I've got something right. We didn't want it. And blow me down, it has dried out and it seems to be fine. The other thing is that on Thursday, I really felt that we hadn't got enough stock in St. Augustine's Pantry to be opening this coming week. And somebody arrived on the doorstep from another food bank with six enormous trays of things. And I wouldn't have been surprised to find feathers on that flight of steps leading up to the front door because it was so obviously an intervention. I had stood in the north transept and said, God, we can't do anything. We'll have nothing to give people. And there it was. He's with us. So grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. And we say together, Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, The first commandment is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, Love your neighbour as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Amen. Lord have mercy. God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to be our advocate in heaven, and to bring us to eternal life. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolved to keep God's commandments, and to live in love and peace with all. We say together, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate thought. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, Forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve him in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who in Jesus Christ has given us a kingdom that cannot be destroyed, forgive you your sins, open your eyes to his truths, strengthen you to do his work, and show you the joy of his kingdom. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit. 
and we will sit for the Genesis reading. Stand for the Gospel. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Christ. Please sit down. Chronologically, we've had a bit of a jump this week, haven't we? Last week we were thinking in terms of the baby and these strange posh people from further east, foreigners, every one of them, coming to pay him homage, and this week he's a fully grown man, finding presumably his cousin or certainly a relative and being baptised. I don't doubt there are quite a few parents about who might wish that their children had grown up that quickly too, but probably very few. So Jesus comes to John, and I don't want to dwell on John's feelings there or Jesus' feelings or what was going on. In fact, I think I did that last year. But I want to focus on the words that Jesus supposedly hears the Father say to him. And I will repeat them for you. You are my beloved, you are my son, the beloved. With you I am well pleased. I was brought up knowing those words. But think for a moment. How would you feel if you heard those words? In those circumstances or similar ones. Well, I think most of us would feel that we were on the right track, which might be some comfort to us. But I also think we'd feel that we were being watched very closely. Perhaps there was a likelihood of criticism in the future. With you I am well pleased does not sound exactly friendly, does it? That the Father was remote. That we'd have to watch our P's and Q's. And that this God could even be nitpicking. Not a very comforting picture, but it's certainly how I would feel. God, in even the translation we're using today, is pictured as very formal, very remote, and very judgmental. 
in terms of the words that he used. And that does tend to reflect the traditional view of God as a judge, a bit remote, and somebody you've got to be very careful of. There are ways in which, I have to say, God gets an even worse press, traditionally. I might tell you about those one day. But I think because there is that view, and it developed over so very, very many years, that it's possible that that view has actually been read into the text either into the original translation or into subsequent modifications because the Bibles we use today, not all of them are based on the original Greek or Hebrew script. They are based on a previous version. And as these versions go on, you get more and more slight modifications which can greatly influence the impression that we get. It's not just the Bible that um, is like that, you find it in science as well. I can think of three areas where I looked at something in a paper and thought, that's not how I understand it. I don't believe that at all. And when I went back, there had been a series of modifications to the wording which was originally used in work published in the 1930s. And over the decades, the meaning had changed. Of course, it, uh, to a large extent, it's the copyright laws, because there's a limit to the number of times you can rewrite something, uh, you can rewrite something, you have to keep rewriting it. So we're not unique, it's, this isn't our fault, it's just something that happens. But it does reflect, in this instance, I think an underlying view of God, formal, judgmental, and a little bit nitpicking. Has anybody heard of Tom Wright? Oh, he will be upset. Dear, dear, dear. Well, Tom, he was a Bishop of Durham at one time. Not the very liberal bishop who was quoted as, as and misunderstood as well when he said that God doesn't exist. He didn't mean there is no God, he meant that God does something more than exist. But quite a conservative bishop, probably 15 years ago. And he is prolific as an author, and he is a very competent theologian as well. He writes some very academic stuff, but he also writes a lot of more accessible work. If, it's, if the author is Tom Wright, it's the accessible stuff. If the author is N.T. Wright, it's the academic stuff. So if you see books on the bookshelf, you might pick up and um, flick through the ones that are Tom. If you flick through the ones that are N.T. Wright, you'll put it back on the shelf very quickly because it takes an awful lot of concentration. But Tom, bless his heart, has gone back for a phenomenal number of Bible books to the original texts, and he's done his own translation, only in the last 10, 15 years. And he translates not, you are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased, but you are my wonderful son, you make me very glad. Now, what would you feel if you heard those words? Uplifted, precious, fully accepted, supported. The meaning isn't all that different. The, the implications are very, very different indeed. And I think we need to reflect on the extent to which we project our own preconceptions onto our image of God. Very often, we ascribe to God characteristics which are not necessarily his at all. They are ours. God won't forgive that. What we actually mean is, I won't forgive that. God forgives everything. 
We all do it. We all make that God in our image. We have a God like us. And, and this is even more interesting, a God who approves and agrees with our societal values. Well, remember, Jesus didn't agree with societal values at all. And he was God in the flesh. So, I don't think that's necessarily true. And we all need to be aware of this tendency to make God in our own image. We need to ask ourselves continuously, is that really God? Or is that just my image, me making him like me? And if we ask that question, we might find we get some very interesting answers. Amen. <clears throat> Let's stand for the creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scripture. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And we'll sit down for the prayer. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We pray for all who feel 
me I must stay away. For I trouble and distress. But they may know of your love and care. Remember all those who are ill, at home, or in hospital. All who are struggling at this time. God ever with us. Hear us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We praise, we praise you for giving us life and life eternal. We remember especially today, friends and loved ones who have enriched our lives, who are now departed from this world. I can think of Jenny Dawson and everyone in your hearts bringing to mind and prayer. We commend to all to you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. Jesus Christ our Lord, and as we obey his command, 
and your Holy Spirit, that broke the bread and wine on the board, may be for us the body and the blood of your dear Son. On the night before he died, he had supper with his friends, and taking bread, he praised you. He broke the bread, gave it to them, and said, Take it, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When supper was ended, he took a cup of wine. Again he praised you, gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Praise to you, Lord Jesus. Dying and destroyed our death. Rising and destroyed our life. Lord Jesus, come to the Lord. Lord of all life. Help us to work together for that day when your kingdom come, and justice and mercy will be seen in all the earth. Look with favour on your people, gather us in your loving arms, and bring us with all the saints to feast at your table in heaven. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory are yours, O loving Father, forever and ever. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not to but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We break this bread to share the body of Christ. Lord, we are ready. We are the Lord. Most merciful Lord, your love compels us to come in. Our hands were of the our hearts were of the we were not fit even to be the promise you might be obtained. But you, Lord, are the God of our salvation, and share your bread with us. So cleanse and feed us with the precious body and blood of your Son, that he may live in us and we in him, and that we, the whole company of Christ, may sing. body of Christ keep you in eternal life. Amen. The blood of Christ keep you in eternal life. Amen. I'm glad to remember today that there are so very few of us for a number of reasons. That in the same way as I could wine on your behalf. We are all receiving communion on behalf, not only of the people who can't be here, but 
the peace of God, which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God, Lord,